The time for debate is over. It is now time for members' statements. Members' statements. I recognize the member for Windsor to come see. So, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you to the government for the news that we've received from the Project P3 pipeline. The construction of our Windsor Essex Regional Acute Care Hospital would be accelerated by a year. Under this government, the previous excuses and inaction holding up the project have stopped, and commitments made to us have been exceeded. I'm very proud to be part of a government that supports Windsor to come see. Speaker, I rise today to roll out the virtual red carpet for the Windsor International Film Festival. It was another banner year for WIF, held from October 27th until November 6th at Windsor's Capitol Theatre, with over 45,000 tickets sold and a new second screenings already scheduled. Vincent Georgi and his team have done an amazing job creating the biggest festival in WIF history with over 300 screenings of 177 films. By coincidence, my wife Mary and I ran into the member for Essex and his wife Jackie at the back of the line for the film Walkerville's Wilson Manor, the, hope, the home that shaped a community directed by Nick Shields, which detailed Will Sedge's rich and fascinating history. Other local favorites included Artifice by writer-director Gavin Michael Booth and North of Normal, featuring the youngest headliner of the festival, River Price Mainpot. The member of Essex and I were also delighted to announce on behalf of Minister Lumsden new Reconnect Ontario funding for WIF in the amount of $185,000. The NWIF board and their volunteers have made lights, camera, action, a beloved part of our community fabric. And to all the volunteers, we send to you our sincere thanks for all of your hard work. Further statements, I recognize the member for London, Fanshawe. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, all MPPs know that there's a lack of supportive housing in Ontario, and my office has heard from many families over the years desperate to find affordable, safe, and permanent housing solutions for their loved ones with development disabilities. The Roger family, their son Patrick, has been waiting for over 10 years. Recently, I heard from a family, the family of Christy, a 50-year-old woman with Down syndrome. Christy's parents are in their 80s and 90s and have moved to assisted living facility. They have been fearless and determined in providing Christy with all the best opportunities for care for the past 50 years. Now they need our help. They need to find Christy a safe and permanent place to live, but they cannot. The system is failing them. Caregivers do their best to take care of their loved ones, but the reality is families cannot be expected to provide this level of support indefinitely. People with disabilities need to know that there's a reliable, supportive housing system for them. They deserve the dignity and independence that can come from living in those homes. And their families deserve the peace of mind that they will be taken care of. This government needs to do what is right. Building and funding supportive housing option needs to be automatic as building any form of housing in Ontario. The families of Patrick and Christy are feeling left behind and cast aside. This government needs to assure them that Bill 23, Building Homes Faster, incorporates a comprehensive plan to create more supportive living accommodations to guarantee all people living with disabilities don't have to wait for decades for a home that they deserve. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, statements. I recognize the member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. I rise this morning to let members know about the Kiwanis Owen Sound Santa Claus Parade I had the pleasure of participating in last Saturday evening. It was the 77th running of the parade, and notwithstanding 60 centimeters of snow having fallen, it was a fantastic show. Local firefighters, paramedics, Canada Post workers, Salvation Army, and many, many more were there, as well as thousands of hardy families watching from snowbanks. And of course, Santa was there to provide his personal joy and spirit of the season. I had the pleasure of walking with the members of the Owen Sound Municipal Council, including both new and re-elected members. I look forward to working with them and other municipal councillors in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. After the parade, it was the Festival of Northern Lights also in downtown Owen Sound. Dozens of light displays were lit up along the banks of the Sydenham River. It was a spectacular display that will keep the downtown lit up through Christmas and New Year's. Next up for Santa is Grey Highlands, my home community, tomorrow, and then next week he's on to Durham, Lion's Head, Meaford, Dundalk, Hanover, and Wyarton. He will be a busy fellow. Speaking of Wyarton, there are now only 71 days before Willie makes his prediction about the arrival of spring. Hey. I understand Wired and Willie is also already starting vocal exercises and ling linguistic training to make sure his views are well understood. I look forward to seeing you all in Wyarton February 2, 2023. Hey. Thank you, Speaker.
Thank you. Member statements. The member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you. Many workers who experience permanent injuries while on the job are forced into poverty and homelessness because the WSIB has a routine policy of turning down claims, forcing injured workers to launch appeals that take years to resolve. Instead of workers getting the financial support they need and are entitled to, they wind up trying to survive on ODSP, thus offloading the financial responsibility of employers onto the public. A free ride for employers and a lose-lose situation for workers and the public. Yesterday, the Minister of Economic Development bragged about cutting employers' WSIB premiums by 30 per cent. Then, later that year, uh, at the same time as injured workers are being forced onto ODSP, he gave $1.2 billion back to employers. Shame. This year, injured workers were betrayed yet again when their cost of living allowance was set a full 2 per cent lower than stipulated in law and in WSIB policy. While this government thinks nothing of showering businesses with money intended to support injured workers, they are happy to rip off workers by deliberately shortchanging them on their cost of living increase. This is disgraceful, it's cruel, and uh, your treatment of people with disabilities is unacceptable. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I rise today in honour and respect of the Ukrainian Holodomor Memorial Day. On the fourth Saturday in November, we commemorate Holodomor Memorial Day across Canada. On this day, we remember the Great Famine of the Soviet Union of 1932 to 1933, when millions of Ukrainians were forcibly starved to death by the Communist Soviet government. The Ukrainian word Holodomor means murder by starvation. Under horrifying and unimaginable con conditions, up to 10 million men, women, and children perished from starvation. Through propaganda, economic control, and the tyrannical need for power, the Stalinist government killed and tortured millions of people. Today, efforts to raise awareness of this tragic genocide against Ukrainian people is stronger than ever. My riding in o of Oakville stands in solidarity with the people of the Ukraine and the Ukrainian community. We share sorrow regarding Russia's military invasion of Ukraine. In 2016, 3.6% of Oakville residents reported having Ukrainian heritage. Over the last eight years, millions of Ukrainians have been displaced by war, and the Halton region and Oakville have welcomed Ukrainian newcomers to our community. I want to thank the St. Joseph's Ukrainian Catholic Church and the St. Vladimir Cultural Center, who have undertaken many initiatives to help the victims of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This Holodomor Memorial Day, let us remember the millions who suffered and died at the hands of the Soviet dictatorship. And let us also think about the 42 million courageous Ukrainians now living in a country under attack and the millions more of Ukrainian dysphoria throughout the world. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, there's a disturbing trend happening across Ontario. Earlier this year, I spoke several times about education support workers who work full-time and go to food banks to feed their children. And earlier this week, I met with SEI healthcare workers. They were at a labour dispute at Carey's Place Autism Services, and one of their concerns is that they work full-time and can't afford to feed their families. Yesterday, I visited McMaster University's teaching assistants at the QP3906 picket line. One of the workers told me, I make so little that I can't afford butter. Speaker, these are all examples of hardworking individuals who still have to rely on food banks to feed themselves and their families. Nobody working full-time should have to go to a food bank. If you're not employed, it's even worse. 65% of food bank users are Ontario Works or ODSP. That's because really receiving less than nine grand a year is intentional legislative poverty. Speaker, nobody can survive on that. The Conservative government can make things better, but they deliberately choose not to. It is almost Christmas. Before we know it, Speaker, politicians across the aisle will start encouraging Ontarians to donate to local food banks. But instead of asking for donations, Conservative government could legislate Ontario's, Ontarians out of poverty. They could fix WSIB. They could double OW and ODSP. They could invest in affordable housing, truly affordable. And they could amend the Employment Standards Act to ensure that employment conditions are safe, they're secure, and they pay a living wage. Thank you, Speaker. 
Thank you. Member statements. The member for Kitchener, South Hesper. Thank you, Speaker. I stand today to tell this House about Aaron Fisher, one of Hespler's own. Tragically, Aaron is now one of Hespler's lost. He passed away this past Friday after a swimming accident that occurred while he was on vacation in the Philippines, what was for him supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. Aaron was only 37. He leaves behind the twin lights of his life, his two young sons, Sammy and Cole. Aaron Fisher had a commitment and dedication to his community that is rarely seen. I only had the chance to meet him once, but his passion and his devotion to Hespeler in particular was obvious. Aaron served as the executive director of the Hespeler BIA and was the admin on multiple local Facebook groups. He managed the yearly creation and maintenance of the free ice rink in Victoria Park and was a vocal supporter of the Hespeler Skate Park project. Aaron was also a champion of citizen-led political engagement. He was the past president of the Kitchener South Hespeler Federal Liberal Association, and over the years he contributed countless hours of his time to liberal campaigns, both federal and provincial. Although Aaron and I were on different sides of the political coin, Aaron was an incredible example to all of us of someone who really put in the work behind his words. Aaron, although we were strangers, I think I can speak for Hespeler when I say, you will be so missed. This message will be recorded and etched forever into the volumes of Hansard. The impact of that may not be felt by all listening, but I believe it would matter to Aaron. And so I'll say his name again, Aaron Fisher. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Green Belt was created in 2005 to prevent further loss of farmland and natural heritage, restrict urban sprawl, and to develop vibrant communities where people can live, work, and play. It cleans our air and water, reduces our flood risks, and provides a home for wildlife. 4,782 farms are protected by the Green Belt, with 68% more revenue earned by Green Belt farms than the average Ontario farm. Last week, I heard from Peggy Brevfeldt, President of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture about Bill 23. She stated, 319 acres of farmland are being lost each day. That is 75 million carrots, 25 million apples, and 1.2 million bottles of VQA wine, for those of you who care, per year. That's why this matters to every single one of us around this table. Maybe you remember the jingle, good things grow in Ontario. Not without our precious farmland and Greenbelt, they won't. Ontario is supposed to be open for business, Mr. Speaker, but it's time we asked whose business? Certainly not Ontario farmers once this government has its way with the land. When the trees are logged and the farmland is paved, what will you eat? Where does this end? I thought our province's abundance of farmland producing fresh food and product for us to enjoy and export around the world was something we were proud of. Once it's gone, it's gone. We won't be able to pass a bill to develop more farmland on top of cement. P.S. Developers need to eat too. I'm going to ask for the attention of the House. It being 10.29 a.m. as provided by the Trans Day of Remembrance Act 2017. The Assembly shall now pause and observe one moment of silence in honour of trans people who have died as a result of anti-trans violence. I'll ask members to please rise.
Thank you. Members may take their seats. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. It is a great honour to rise today to raise awareness of an issue in which impacts women and girls in Ontario. The month of November marks Women Abuse Prevention Month and the 10th anniversary of Ontario's RAP Encourage campaign. Le mois de novembre marque le mois de la prévention de la violence faite aux femmes et la The month of March marks the month of prevention of violence against women. We know that we need to pay more attention to violence against women and girls in our province. Remember, there have been over 40 documented femicides in Ontario. This means 40 intentional killings of women for no other reason than their gender. Moreover, countless more women and girls are trying to survive in unsafe households, on the streets and in our communities. The Wrapped in Courage campaign, organized by the Ontario Association of Interval and Transitional Houses, has been helping women since 2013. The campaign has been bringing attention to gender-based violence across Ontario by wearing purple scarves. Each year throughout November, Ontarians are asked to show their support for survivors of women abuse by wearing a purple scarf, which can be purchased from their local women's shelter. In my community of Peel, organizations like Embrave, the Peel Committee Against Women Abuse, Take Back the Night Foundation, and Amar Gut House are doing incredible work supporting survivors. I was proud to recently participate in the T Take Back the Night March with our Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity in Brampton to show our support and dedication to ending gender-based violence in Ontario. I would like to encourage all members of this House to wear their right wrapped in courage purple scarves on Tuesday, November 29th, in recognition of Women Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you, Speaker. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Member statements? The member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. I want to take the time this morning to recognize the tremendous contributions the Bren family has been making to Ontario's agriculture industry. Mm -hmm. Brenby Farms has been growing crops and raising livestock on their 2,000 acres in Flamborough for four generations. Wow. Brenby Farms dates back to 1915 when the property was purchased by Thomas Bren. Thomas' great-grandsons, Chris and Sean, are now running the business. This past September, the brothers took the Premier, Minister Thompson, and myself on a tour of their farm. And at the time, they were harvesting potatoes. They have a reputation for growing high-quality potatoes. Bren B harvests about 28 million pounds of potatoes each and every year. They are a leader in food safety and traceability. With the help of Omafra, they have invested in technology that can monitor their products for quality and safety from planting to retail distribution. They sell to every major grocer right across Canada. Brand B has always kept up with the changing technology. They have received recognition for being progressive farmers of the future. I want to congratulate Brand B Farms for continuing their tradition of producing high quality crops. They have been feeding people across Ontario and beyond for over a century. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. Introduction of visitors. We have with us in the chamber today a former member of the legislature who served as the member for Parkdale High Park in the 38th, 39th, 